want to talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan, the second of the parables in our series of the Magnificent Seven Parables. But before we get into the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is found in Luke chapter 10, I want us to set the scene and the background of what's going on in this particular time frame as our Lord Jesus Christ gives these parables on his way to Jerusalem. Because if we can understand the background, we can, we can enter into the emotions and the feelings of what's going on through our Lord Jesus Christ's mind, as well as the minds of his disciples and those people that are following him. Because the pressure is going to build and the pressure is building, building and, and, and building all the time. And it's not just affecting our Lord Jesus Christ, it's affecting those who follow him. And, and, and what we need to understand that is in Luke chapter 9, we have a record of the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And, and that particular miracle is recorded by all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, all speak about that particular event. When we come to the parable of the Good Samaritan, only Luke's going to record it. But the previous events, 12 months before Jesus' crucifixion, it's all recorded for us about what's happening. And it centres around this feeding of the 5,000. But what happens at that time, as a, as a lead up to that particular time, we find that Matthew, Mark and John record these things. They say in Matthew chapter 14, for example, concerning this period of time, he, we read, So Herod sent and had John beheaded in prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. When the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. So we have this period of time that's marked the beheading or the death of John the Baptist. We've got to remember, John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. But John the Baptist also had a commission to prepare the way of Jesus for Jesus. And, and, and so what we're being told here in Matthew chapter 14 is that John the Baptist is now dead. John 6 is going to tell us it's Passover time. And Jesus knows that it's 12 months to go before he also is going to lose his life. So the pressure's really mounting on Jesus. He now knows that he's into the last 12 months. It's almost like the last lap before he faces the cross. And so we're given this information about John the Baptist dies. When Jesus hears it, he wants to get away to a desert place by himself. But when the multitudes hear it, they follow him on foot. And so Jesus is right up in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. He's right up near Capernaum and Bethsaida. And he's going to take a boat from one side of the lake to the other in the top corner to get away to a desert place. But Luke adds some information for us to give us even a better picture of what's happening. Luke chapter 9 verse 10 says, And the apostles, when they returned, that is, they'd been out preaching and teaching, when they returned, they told Jesus all that they had done, and when he took them and went aside privately, he took them into a desert place belonging to the city of Bethsaida. So here's some additional information the disciples return from a preaching campaign. They start to tell Jesus everything. And Jesus says, let's get away to a quiet place by ourselves. So it's now Jesus and his disciples getting away to a deserted place or a quiet place up near Bethsaida. And then Mark, he adds to it to, to give us this full picture of the events that are taking place. Mark chapter 6 verses 30 to 34 says, then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. We saw that from, 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 from the other quotations. And Jesus said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there are many comings and goings, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in a boat by themselves. So the, the picture's clear. The pressure's mounting. It's 12 months to go. And Jesus really wants to catch his breath, as it were. He wants to mourn the death of his cousin, John. 
He wants to spend some quality time with his disciples because there's so much going on. People coming and going. They'd been out. He wants to get away and have a little break with those that are closest to him. And he's going to get in the boat, go across the top corner of the Sea of Galilee into a deserted place where he can spend some quality time alone with these special, special people. But what happens is we continue in Mark chapter 6 and verse 33. But the multitude saw them departing and many knew him and ran there for on the foot on foot from all the cities. And they arrived before them and came together to him. So that they, they ran around the lake and they beat him. By the time the boat had zigzagged its way across, you know, perhaps into a headwind or, or whatever it took. By the time the boat got to the shore, the people had outran the boat and they were standing on the shore. And look at it says, this is amazing. And Jesus, when he came out of the boat, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not even having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. We need to understand that, that John the Baptist had had such a profound influence on the people that, that many people had gone to John down in Jordan, been baptized, and they were, they were, they were you know, following John the Baptist who was preparing the way for the Lord. But suddenly John the Baptist dead. He's been executed. And now they're lost. And they go, well, who's our leader now? And, and some people are saying, well, it must be this Jesus. We, we, we must follow Jesus. And now they're following Jesus. And when Jesus steps off the boat, even though his intention is to have some quality time to himself, he sees them and he sees they're lost. He sees their leader has, has been, been taken from them. And now they're leaderless. And so Jesus has compassion upon them. He has compassion on them. And so he talks to them and he teaches them and he gives that amazing miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, more likely 10 to 20,000. And so Jesus, appreciating and sensing their loss, teaches the people and spends time with them. And of course, Jesus wants them to focus their thoughts and their attentions on listening to him. Jesus wants them to know that his message is an important message of life. And so Jesus now, having given that, he goes with his disciples and he starts to continue this teaching program around Galilee and around the areas of Capernaum and Bethsaida. And Luke chapter 9, as we come now into this period of time, as we get ready to hear the parable of the Good Samaritan, Luke 9.51 says, Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up. In other words, the time for his resurrection. He, had steadfa he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus now starts to head to Jerusalem. There's no turning back now. He leaves Galilee. He leaves the cities around Galilee and he's making his way down south and he's coming down south and he's going to come towards the city of Jericho and when he gets to Jericho, he's going to turn right and he's going to head up the road from Jericho to Jerusalem where ultimately he's going to be crucified. He's now on his way to the cross. He's now on his way to his crucifixion. And as he comes towards Jericho and Jerusalem, he's teaching as he goes. And it's in this time frame he gives the parable of the Good Samaritan. So it's a time of great pressure. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of anxiety going on around this time when this parable is going to be given. And that's the background to what's happening. And what happens is, this parable, which is which is often used as a as, as a phrase to to demonstrate a random act of kindness by a stranger, that's that's often the way that this this term, the Good Samaritan, is used. The story is taken from Luke ten verses twenty five to thirty seven, and again, like Jesus did with the parable of the sower, Jesus is going to introduce this story with the words "listen" or "behold," depending on which translation you've got. So Jesus is saying, listen, behold, listen to me. I've got something that's really important to tell you. I want you to listen. I want you to hear what I'm going to tell you because it's important. Jesus is not wasting time. 
He's not wasting words now. Time is precious to him and he wants the people to listen. And what he wants them to first of all understand as he wants us to understand. He wants us to understand how blessed we are. How fortunate we are to hear his words. This is our Lord Jesus Christ speaking. This is not a narrator. It's not an inspired writer writing his thoughts. These are the words of Jesus. These are the very words of the God of the Son of God that are speaking to us. And he and, and, and the writer says, Consider yourselves blessed that you're hearing these amazing lessons. Because there's there's kings and there's prophets, he says in verse 24, that have desired to hear these things and they haven't got to. Imagine that. There are kings and prophets that wanted to hear these things, but they didn't. And we do. We get to hear them. How blessed are we? How fortunate are we? And so in verse 25, a lawyer comes onto the scene and he steps up. And, and, and to understand who a lawyer is, that means he's a master. A master of the Old Testament scriptures. And he comes up to Jesus and he's going to test Jesus. And he's going to ask Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? That's the question. What have I got to do to inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus responds to his question by asking him a question. We're, all, we're often told never to answer a question with a question. But Jesus is the master teacher. And Jesus throws that idea away and he asks a question of the questioner and he says what's written in the law now the reason he said that is because he knows that this man's an expert he's a lawyer he's a lawyer of the law he knows the law inside out back front upside down he's an expert in the matter of the laws and so jesus says What's written in the law? And of course, the lawyer would have thought, oh, that's easy. And he responds in verse 27 by saying, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. Now these words are taken directly out of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy says, time and time again, that thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Over and over again, it's told in Deuteronomy. And in fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6, the last time it's said in Deuteronomy, it says that you are told to love the Lord your God with all your heart and, all your, and with all your soul, that thou mayest live. So having been told to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, many times, the last time in Deuteronomy, the words added are that thou mayest live. And Jesus picks up on that and he says to the lawyer, you've answered correctly. Great answer. Good answer. Do this and live. He, he, he picks up the words of Deuteronomy. He says, you're right. Do this and live. Do it, he says. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. Do it. But the lawyer knows he can't do it. The lawyer knows he can't do what he just said he was supposed to do. And the reason he knows that is because he's never been able to do it. Not perfectly. We're all able to love God at times. But none of us are able to love God perfectly 100% of the time. And even though this lawyer had studied his Bible all of his life, he knew the law back to front and inside out, he knew he couldn't do it perfectly. So to justify himself, to make himself righteous, and to be able to excuse himself, he asked Jesus, well, who's my neighbour? You notice he doesn't ask about the first part, about loving God. That's a given. The first part is love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. 
That's a given. But the second part is to love your neighbour as yourself. Let's qualify that. And let's, let's, let's be really specific about that so that I know who I've got to love. But more especially, I want to know who I don't have to love. So it's a trick question. Because as soon as Jesus opens the door by qualifying who is his neighbour, as soon as Jesus says, well, that person or that type of person is your, your neighbour and, and that type of person and, and that type of person, what it does is it immediately opens the door for this group over here that are not your neighbour. And at the top of that list would have been the Samaritans. And so the lawyer puts this trick question to Jesus. Tell me, master, who's my neighbour? And the lawyer and the crowd and the leaders with the scribes and the Pharisees would have all watched that have turned their eyes and their focus now onto Jesus and that have watched and waited with bated breath. You would have been able to hear a pin drop in the silence as they waited to hear how Jesus was going to answer. And so Jesus answers with the parable, with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now we know this parable. We, we, we know this parable well. A man goes down to Jerusalem, uh, goes down to Jericho from Jerusalem, and he's robbed. Now this road, you know, it's a treacherous road. But he goes down this road, this road, he gets robbed, he gets beaten, and he gets left for dead on the side of the road in the wilderness. This road was notorious. I've, I've had the, the, the good fortune to have driven up and down this road, because now it's a, it's a nice highway, but in, in those days, it was a little dirt narrow road going down all the way from the top of Jerusalem all the way down to Jericho, which is below sea level. And as I said, it's a notorious road. It's a road that passes over the Judean hills, which are basically a dirty, rocky, dusty wasteland. They are the badlands. They are the badlands. It was a wilderness out there with robbers and thieves and wild animals. And so this man goes down and he's robbed and beaten and left for dead. And we know in time, a priest, a priest of the house of God comes to where the man laid dying, beaten and bleeding. But once the priest sees him, he passes right by him. He doesn't stop. He passes by. And then in time, a Levite comes. And the Levite comes down the road and, and he sees the man lying, bleeding, dying. And he passes by on the other side of the road. And then Jesus suddenly introduces a Samaritan into the story. The, the Jewish crowd would have gasped. Like up until this time, the story would have been rolling along and the people would have been listening intently. But all of a sudden, Jesus mentions the word Samaritan and the crowd would have, oh, did, did he just say Samaritan? Are you sure he said Samaritan? Because the Jews hated the Samaritans. The Jews hated them. Of all the people, of all the races on earth, the Samaritans were the most hated people by the Jews, even more so than the Romans. They despised them. Surely this, this man Jesus is not going to introduce the Samaritans as the, as the hero to this story. You know, the Samaritans were hated because they were a mixed race. They were hated because the Jews that had been taken prisoner by the, by the Syrians in, in, in 700 years before Christ, had then been basically taken away and, and Syrians had been brought down into the land and they'd mixed with the Jews. And so these Jews and Syrians had mixed, intermarried and, 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 and become pagan idol worshippers and they'd become all mixed up. And so when we hear about the story of the woman of Samaria and Jesus says, you have no idea what you understand, it's because they were totally confused, totally compromised. They'd become pagan idol worshippers. They were all mixed up. And the Jews hated this compromised race of people. 
And so the Jews hated the Samaritans. But Jesus continues his story. He continues his story by telling how this Samaritan man stops and he comforts the man. He attends to his wounds with expensive oil and wine. He lifts him up onto his own donkey. He carries him, walking by his side with his donkey to an inn and to an innkeeper. And when he gets to the inn, he cares for him there and he stays overnight with him there. And the next morning, he pays the innkeeper for the night's stay and for the next few nights to continue caring for this man. And he promises to pay even more if there are further expenses when he returns. And Jesus concludes his story by asking the lawyer, well, which of these three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, was the neighbor? Which one was the neighbor? And this, this Jewish lawyer, this man who knows his word of God so well, couldn't even bring himself to saying the word, the Samaritan. All he could say was, well, he had showed mercy. And even then he would have been choking on his words. So what's the lesson? What's the lesson that Jesus wants us to learn and understand? Clearly Jesus wants us to initiate love and kindness one to another. Even to our worst enemy. Even to those who hate and despise us. That's what Jesus wants us to do. There's no doubt about that. That's a part of the commandments, remember. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God. And the second commandment is to love your neighbor. But there's far more to this parable than just that. Far more. Jesus wants us to see ourselves in this story. Jesus wants us to understand that we are part of this story. We are the beaten, broken man in this parable. We're the man that's been traveling through the wilderness. Jesus says in Deuteronomy that he's taken our lives through a journey of life. And that journey of life is going to take us through a wilderness. And he's taking us through our life's journey, he says, to test us and to humble us. To see what's in our heart. That's what the journey is all about. And so then he took the children of Israel on a 40 year journey through the wilderness to test them to see where their heart was. Do you really love the Lord your God with all your heart? Or not? And so now in this story, we're the man on this journey. But along this journey, we become beaten and left for dead. We're dying. We're left on the roadside. Because of our sins, we are a dying race of people. We are dying because of our sins. The wages of sin is death, says the Apostle Paul. And the priest and the Levite, they come and they pass by because the law couldn't save. The law couldn't save. Nobody, including this lawyer who was asking the question, knew that he could keep that commandment perfectly. It was impossible. So this priest and this lawyer represent the law in this parable. They represent the law as moral, flawed human beings. We can't keep the law perfectly as hard as we try. As much as we want to keep the law, we can't. Under the law, we have sinned. And if we've sinned just once, you know, we excuse ourselves lots of times by saying it was just a little lie, it was just a, a little loss of temper, it was just a little this, a little that. And we excuse ourselves. But God's word is really clear. The wages, the payment for sin is death. If we sin just once, just once, we are condemned to death. And we become like that man left for dead on the roadside. We are condemned to death. What Jesus wants us to understand is, if not for the Samaritan in this story, that man would have died. And the lesson is that if not for Jesus, we too would die without a hope. Jesus loves us. He loves us with such a depth of love that it passes all understanding. 
This Samaritan comes upon this man and he looks at a dying man and he has compassion on him. Can you see the connections that Jesus looked at the crowd six months, nine months early and he looked at the crowd and he had compassion on them because they were lost. And as Jesus looks at us and has compassion on us, he stoops down and he comforts us. And he continually speaks to us and tells us to bring our burdens upon him. Put our burdens on Jesus, we are told. He wants to comfort us. He stoops down and he tends to our needs. He attends to our wounds. He spares nothing. He spares nothing to help us, to heal us. And he picks us up and he carries us to his family. He carries us just like the Samaritan carried this man to the inn. And he paid the price. He paid the price, the full price for his care. And today, as we come to the inn with our Samaritan, with our Lord Jesus Christ, and with our innkeeper, who's the innkeeper? The innkeeper's our Heavenly Father. The innkeeper is God. And Jesus paid the full price to the innkeeper. Thy will be done, not mine. Thy will be done. And Jesus has promised to return just like the Samaritan has promised to return. But while he's away, the innkeeper, our God, our loving Heavenly Father, he's promised to care and provide for all of our needs. All we have to do is love him. Love him with all of our hearts, our souls, our strength and our mind. And love our neighbour. Love one another. That's what we have to do. Greater love hath no man than this, says Jesus, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Don't talk about it. Do it, says Jesus. Do it. And Jesus concludes the parable by saying unto the lawyer and unto us, go and do likewise. Amen.